Thank you, Kara. Uh, perfect pronunciation, I have to say. Uh, let's see. I need something to move the slides. There it is. And I need some pointer also. Is it in here also? Yeah. yeah. OK, good. So I think we ended already the talk. So can we back up from the beginning, please? <laughs> Since apparently, as you know, Sweden is far away, and my title didn't make it here for some reason. So I, I had the chance actually to modify the title during the flight here, which is a long flight. Uh, so I called it uh, Targeted Molecular Diagnosis of ME-CFS, The Devil is in the Details. And I would try to explain how I'm thinking about this. And of course, it's a bit accurate uh, to use uh, Tasmanian Devil when you're so close to Tasmania here. Uh, so we will talk a bit about what we're doing in Uppsala. We will also talk about uh, the collaboration we have. And I think also I want to address that uh, Open Medicine Foundation, uh, Invest in Me, uh, also Solve ME has been very much helping us to actually get collaborative work going, both within Europe and also now with the United States, uh, and hopefully also Australia uh, in some time. Uh, but let's go to Uppsala first. Uppsala is just on the other side of the globe, so it's a far away flight. Uh, Alan also already told you that we, on the other side of the world, have a pretty cold weather. So this is last week in Uppsala, no, out, outside Uppsala. And it's so cold, so the mooses aren't even there anymore. <laughs> and uh, you can barely see pieces of reindeer sticking up from the snow, so deep snow. <laughs> Terrible. So it's very nice to be here, and I'm very sorry that I flew in this morning and I will leave in a couple of days. I would love to stay here for a bit more of time. So we had the snow melting away from, from our countryside. Uh, I don't know what you know about Sweden, but uh, what's the most famous thing uh, in Sweden uh, based on Australian people? ABBA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did I know? They came here in 1977 on a world tour. Uh, apparently that was uh, set some fingerprints or blueprints of, of uh, Swedish characters in, in Australia. I just learned that uh, ABBA will, had promised not to uh, reoccur again, but they will come in a virtual format 2019 to Australia, actually. So you can go to, uh, I guess, a cinema theater somewhere and see them almost live, virtual reality forms, like avatars, apparently. Uh, but as a scientist, I would, and from Uppsala, I would hope that you actually knew something more about Sweden. So I will give you a bit of history about uh, how Sweden is actually related to Australia also in the end. So this is Carl von Linné, a professor at Uppsala University. He was a medical doctor, but he he was not doing too well in that field, so he started uh, looking into botany instead and collected plants all over the world, uh, or actually sent his students to collect them. Uh, but he gave, gave the names and all the Latin names that are used for plants and insects, etc., and some animals are based on his uh, Systema Naturica, which was the, the Latin book that he wrote. He sent out students, 17 students around the world, and actually some of them reached Australia, as you can see on this map. Uh, many of them died on different places on, in, in the world, but uh, the ones who came to Australia actually did pretty well. So they, they came with uh, Captain Cook. Uh, the first one was Daniel Solander. And Daniel Solander, he came to Sydney and uh, to the Botany Bay, and actually that's why it's called Botany Bay outside Sydney and collected a lot of material. And later on, uh, another student of Linnea came uh, called uh, Anders Sparman, as you see. But you see, they've been almost everywhere, even to Canada for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Daniel Solander, he was a pretty happy guy, actually. This is how he looked. Uh, he, he wasn't happy that for so, so long time, though. He died the age of 49 or 50. Uh, the thing is, we went to, to these excursions around the world, they did pretty well on the ship apparently, uh, came across a lot of different small species that he brought. Uh, and he was also uh, taking 
party with a lot of other famous scientists when he was traveling with, Kim, uh, with Captain Cook. So this is supposed to be Australia. I don't know why they actually carried a statue with them when they were <laughs> getting down to, to uh, Australia. I'm not sure if that's an artist's uh, decoration but only. Uh, however, this was also made uh, notice of in Australia that Donny Solander came to Australia and found a lot of plants and, and also helped naming some of them with a the ship endeavorer, as you see in the bottom stamp here. So that's actually a Swedish Australian stamp collection. You can start your collection there. It's supposed to work even in Sweden to send letters with these stamps. However, Donald Solander, one, on his way back to Scandinavia and to Sweden, he stopped by in England and uh, he never came back to Uppsala. And that made his uh, teacher and uh, economic supporter, I would say, a bit upset. So he says, Carl von Linnea says about uh, Solander in Swedish, in old Swedish, Den otacksamme Solander giver mig en enda ört eller insekt av det han samlat i Insulan Australia, Nova. That means the ungrateful bastard Solander did not give me any of those plants or insects that he actually collected in Australia. <laughs> he, <laughs> he came to London and he actually became the librarian of uh, uh, the British Museum in the end. And he died in, in London uh, in the end. <laughs> A lot of Linnaeus collections also ended up in London later on because his uh, widow sold most of it to, to a, a British collector, actually. But it's preserved there in the Linnaeus so uh, Society, which is very nice. Okay, over to another exploration then. So what are we doing uh, in MECFS uh, from our perspective? And I, I moved around in my slides a bit, so now I'm, I'm going to do a bit of proteomics, a bit of metabolomics. And I actually moved some things in here just to tied together with things we have heard earlier this morning. So our focus is uh, a lot on the neuroimmune relative uh, interaction when it comes to MECFS and, and other neurological disorders that we are working with. So just as a recapitulation for you guys, that the relation between the immune system and the central nervous system is very important and it's also controlling a lot of the functionalities we have in the human body, which is uh, uh, very good in in healthy state, but it comes quite complicated and, and uh, could be a disaster in disease states. So we have the interaction with pathological immune interaction when it comes to breakdown in neurodegenerative diseases. Multiple sclerosis is one typical example where we have an autoimmune uh, reactivity against the myelin sheets and that in the end kills the neurons. Uh, we have a control, a control of the uh, central nervous system by trans transports or trafficking of, of immune cell-like structures like microglia. We have uh, immune CNS uh, interactions when it comes to homeostasis. We have a protective immune system when it comes to injury and disease also in the central nervous system. Although uh, most of the time the body tries to control the immune reaction when it comes to uh, regions of central nervous system. So it's often called immune privilege sites, just to uh, address that immune reaction or large immune reactions is not what we want in, in the central nervous system. And then when it comes to other peripheral organs, uh, we, have, we have reactions and the maturation processes and also as we will come to a bit later, uh, the gut brain axis where we have effects of the central nervous system on the gut and we also have the gut affecting the central nervous system uh, and also talking about microbiome in the end here. Uh, so how did I end up in MECFS? Well, very much by coincidence. Uh, we've done a lot of studies on central nervous system based on cerebrospinal fluid detection. And uh, we were going to do a collaborative work with, with colleagues in the United States uh, where we looked at post-Lyme uh, disease patients or post-treatment Lyme disease patients and neur neuroborreliosis patients. And then at that time, we were going to do a profiling of these patients. Uh, colleagues came with the first chronic fatigue patients uh, that I've seen. So we used cerebrospinal fluid from both these cohorts. And to make it very short, we compared the patterns on 
deep proteomic profiling and we found that there is a lot of similarities between healthy individuals, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, uh, and these post-treatment uh, Lyme disease patients. But you can also see that there is, sorry, uh, there is distinct uh, differences. So we have specific patterns that is unique for the chronic fatigue group. We have specific patterns that are unique for the post-treatment Lyme disease patients. And we also have, of course, in our healthy control specific markers there. But in general, the overlap is, is very big, as you see here. So if we conclude that study, uh, what we could tell is that there is actually, a, uh, although low grade, but a neuroinflammatory reaction going. And we have specific protein markers that tells us that uh, when we monitor it in central nervous system by cerebrospinal fluid analysis. Uh, we also have signs of increased synaptic plasticity and uh, neuro migration activity, and that is actually not a good thing in this case. It's uh, also the same phenomena we see in new other neurodegenerative processes like Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease. And we also see that the ME-CFS patients have definitely a problem with some of their axonal regeneration and repair systems. So that is uh, something that could lead to uh, long-term uh, illness and chronic illness in the end. Uh, when it comes to the metabolome, we already heard about metabolome today quite a lot. And the complexity of the metabolome is, is uh, enormous. It is rep representing the physiological endpoint, uh, and it's, as uh, Alan said also, it's a genetic predeposition and environmental influence in combination. So uh, that is what makes up our phenotype normally and also in, in uh, disease states. So what makes it so complex? Well, there is a lot of things that we have to take into account. Uh, first of all, if we look into uh, the metabolome compared with the proteome and with the genome. We know that the genome is uh, fairly simple in that sense, that we have four bases that we are building a genome on, although the complexity of a genome can be, can be quite a lot if it com comes into epigenetics also. Uh, when it comes to the proteome and the proteins built, it's about 20 amino acids. But when it comes to the metabolome, we have uh, yeah, two to f 10 to the five uh, different uh, chemicals in there. So thousands and thousands of chemicals that can be affected. And when it comes to the pyramid of life, as you see here in the lower part of the picture, you see that in mammalians, we're actually not so complex when it comes to, to the metabolome. We have 20,000 different chemicals approximately in, the, in our bloodstream that we can measure. When it comes to microbes, the Metabolome gets much more complex, so about 60,000 different chemical substances. And when it comes to the plants, there are over 200,000 uh, chemicals that have been detected now and, and mapped for the metabolome. So in that sense, the mammalians are, are less complex, of course. Then we should remember that quite a few of the things that we find in, in uh, mammalian samples can also be derived from food intake of different plants or by the microbes production in our intest intestinal tract, for instance. Uh, so when it comes to a metabolome study then, or a proteome study, we can make this uh, a quite complex history because the technology today has developed so much. And uh, I think Ron spoke about uh, this in the morning, which I unfortunately missed. But the complexity of the big data and handling big data sets is, is something that we face today. So I've just made this very small calculation to show how complex it can become. So let's say we, we select a patient group of 20, a uh, very small pilot study. We have half women, half men. We take samples from them, maybe 10 different tissue samples or body fluids or fecal samples. We maybe collect a few samples per day, and we do it over time, so let's say 10 different time points, just to try to map the omics uh, in these uh, individuals. So that only makes up 10,000 samples, just that little 20 individual uh, study. And let's say we, we make uh, 2,000 proteins per sample in general in, in, in these sets, 
uh, and maybe 2,500 metabolites per sample. So then we come up with about 20 million protein signals that we have to take care of and maybe 25,000 metabolomic signals that we have to take into account when it comes to, to doing uh, data analysis in the end. So of course, uh, data handling and big data handling is something that is crucial in, in the field. Uh, when it comes to the metabolomic then, uh, we have two strategies in, in Uppsala. We do quite a lot of targeted metabolomics where we actually are from the beginning uh, selecting a pathway or a family of molecules or a known set of uh, just a few molecules of interest. So we actually know what we're looking for and then we can use uh, standard technologies. We can do quantitative measurements and we can know uh, for a selective set of markets what we are doing. So the technology is normally liquid chromatography, uh, tandem mass spectrometry with high resolution, or as you will see, uh, ultra performance con uh, convergence chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, so we do a selective uh, set of markers. We do standardized techniques for measuring quantitative. Uh, we correlate the findings with uh, different locations in the body or different biological systems. It can be a tissue type or cell type. Uh, and then we do uh, variability tests and, and look for differences in controls in patients, for instance. So that, the usefulness of this is uh, quite high because we can set an absolute quantitative level. So that's, that data is translation, trans, possible to translate to other research groups. Uh, we can send out nanogram per ml, or we can send out uh, femtomolar concentration, for instance, of, of each individual substance, and that makes it translational in, a, in another way than the untargeted metabolomic profiles are doing. So in this untargeted approach, we don't know what we're looking for, so we just try to screen for everything. Uh, and we can do that in, uh, in all different sets of samples by tandem mass spectrometry connected with liquid chromatography or other methods in advance or using NMR, as we also heard uh, earlier this morning. Uh, and then we just do advanced pattern recognition initially, align the data sets and try to figure out if there are any differences, what are those differences related to. So we, we in the later stage of the analysis, find out hopefully what it can be. Sometimes we can't even identify what is the difference. We, we can see that there is a difference in the pattern but we're not able to identify what the difference is due to. Uh, very useful for exploratory work and for, for finding new targets, but also a problem is that quite often we don't get absolute quantitation, so we can't really get the translational part. We get relative quantitative data, which can be a problem. And it's also some of these data sets that are out in literature based on untargeted metabolomics is also showing quite a big variability and uh, not reproducibility when it comes to different groups around the world. So a problem there. So just an example of a targeted strategy then, and this is something we've been working with uh, for quite a while with different disorders, but I thought of uh, MECFS as one target for targeted steroidomics then when we look at steroid and steroid hormones. And, um, Steroid hormones are very important for a lot of things. Uh, there are neurosteroids that control synaptic plasticity and, and synaptic regulation. But steroids can also be very much involved in the regulation of the immune system. So this busy cartoon here shows that when we have a steroid uh, binding to a, a specific receptor, this receptor can actually be internalized into the cell, cell nuclei and also control a lot of the mechanism in the transcription. Uh, inside the cell, uh, cell and nuclei. And also affecting, for instance, inflammatory stimuli uh, of, yeah, as you recognize here, interleukin 1 beta, TNF alpha, et cetera, et cetera. And actually block or stimulate depending on what steroid is, is uh, binding into the receptors and internalized into the nuclei. So that will affect gene level and also affect the stimuli or a result of the stimuli we have on the cell. Uh, the biosynthesis of steroid hormones is pretty complex. Uh, this is just actually one part of the steroid hormone uh, profile. Uh, if we look at, for instance, estrogens here, we can actually uh, 
fold out a tree of uh, 16 other metabolites just from estrogen in that region. So the pattern gets extremely complex. But when you look at the pattern like this, you can see that we have uh, en specific enzymatic pathways that are regulated. And we can also know that many diseases when it comes to steroid hormone dysfunction is related to blockages or, or less efficient enzymes in different levels. And that will affect a lot the end pro product of the steroid hormones. So what we did in, in our set, uh, we developed a, a new method, you could say, for detecting all of these steroid hormones and one, at one time point. A lot of the earlier techniques only could measure one or two at a time, but we can monitor the whole pathway. Uh, with in this assay now including 25 different steroids at the same time. And it's based on a technique called supercritical fluid chromatography or ultra performance convergence chromatography is another name, and then connected to tandem mass spectrometry. And the method is published now, so you can have a look if you're interested. It's a quite simple technique. You take your body fluid, plasma for instance, you do a liquid liquid extraction of the steroid uh, markers and then you derivatize them and then you run uh, high resolution separation and tandem mass spectrometry for the detection. And we get down to picogram uh, per ml levels in, in most of the steroids here, uh, low level of those. So in the study we have done, uh, so far not published, and this is supported by Open Medicine Foundation and also by the Swedish patient organization, Aramia. Uh, we took Swedish patients, 24 well-characterized patients, and we used uh, 24 healthy controls, sex and age matched, uh, collected at the same time, handled at the same time, uh, stored uh, following very strict protocol. So trying to avoid variability in the sample set as much as pos possible, and also including uh, quality control and quality analysis samples uh, in the set. So what we found, uh, is that we have a fairly high variability of these steroids. This is just a subset of the data, but you can see that we have our control and the MECFS group next to each other. And you see that there is a large overlap, but also a large spread and some outliers in the data set. And the only steroid that popped out as significantly different is the pregnenolone here. And if we remember how the pathway is, we see that the pregnenolone is a key um, metabolite of the steroid hormone uh, protein profile or steroid hormone profile. Um, we did not find a difference in cholesterol in our study. Uh, we have very strict uh, diet control of the patient we collected, so that could be a reason why they didn't discriminate so much between the two patient and controls. I don't know. Um, but you see this one came out and also made blue uh, marks here. And the blue marks shows that enzymatic activity for producing pregnenolone, for instance, is in, is in the mitochondrial membrane. And also for other uh, metabolites here in the steroid profile, the enzyme is actually sitting in the uh, mitochondrial membrane. And although these did not pop out significant different in our groups, uh, they were they were altered, not, not significantly, but tendency to be altered. So what we conclude is that pregnenolone is, uh, in our data set, uh, differently regulated in the ME-CFS patients versus controls. Uh, it's a newer steroid, so it's highly, uh, highly produced in the central nervous system. It is a synaptic functioning regulator. It is neuroprotective and it enhances uh, myelinization. And it improves cognitive and memory function. So a reduction of pregnenolone could definitely uh, give some of the symptoms we see in the MECFS patients. And it's produced in the mitochondria, why we believe now that the mitochondrial dysfunction could be one of the reasons for this finding. Uh, and this data set that I will go through now is just just came uh, to us and is just now submitted and it's a collaboration with Simon Cardin group at uh, QIB, the Quadrum uh, Institute of Biology in Norwich, UK and this study has been supported by the Invest ME 
And I took it because I saw that there were discussions about severe ill ME-CFS patients. And uh, what Simon and his student, Daniel uh, Verpond, had, had done, they have collected at home patients with uh, severe ME-CFS, mostly bedbound, and also been able to have household controls collected at the same time. And they collected uh, fecal samples and uh, plasma from these patients and controls. And I was involved in the metabolomic profiling of, of these uh, patient samples then. So the idea and the thought about this study from the beginning is the gut-brain axis uh, relationship that some of you know much about. But in a normal healthy individual, we have a relation and a co-regulation of the central nervous system activity uh, through the HPA axis, for instance. Uh, on the steroid hormone level, uh, on the gut function, uh, and also vice versa, a normal functioning gut without leakage, for instance, will also have a positive effect back onto the central nervous system. So if you eat healthy diet, if you, have, uh, uh, you don't have the uh, problem with uh, probiotics or you get the pro probiotics there, you'd write the good biotics, the good microbi microbiome, uh, they put in this slide, breastfeeding and natural birth, which that is affecting the microbiome. Uh, then you have the healthy brain-gut uh, axis going. When you have stressors, uh, C-section is here, formula feeding, but unhealthy diet, uh, infections, um, stressors of different kinds, uh, antibiotics could be one. You get the unfunctional brain uh, gut-brain axis then, which leads to dysfunctional regulation of central nervous system, uh, dysfunctional regulation of the steroid hormone le levels, a leaky gut, uh, and a changed and altered microbiome in the end. So uh, bad side and good side in this case. Uh, so what was done in the study was that uh, NMR was used for the metabolomic profiling and uh, the they looked at initially at the fecal water, so fecal samples were uh, extracted by a buffer basically, and then uh, the NMR was done for metabolomic profiling. And uh, to, bit to, to the surprise, I would say, uh, not so much came out of this. What came out as positive, uh, significantly difference between the severe ME patients and their household uh, controls was a slight change in uh, the glycocholate and also in, uh, in a butyrate uh, metabolite. So uh, you see there's a big variability and large overlaps in all the metabolites that were screened for here. But if you take them all into account and you do a principal component analysis, you can actually pull out that the severe ME patients is grouping here and you have the household controls in the green here. I think the laser is dying on me here. I hope you can see the green color at least. So this is based on 45 different metabolites that were uh, made absolute quanti uh, quantitation on. And uh, with the principal component, you can see these differences pop out. But the differences are not very, very uh, large, I have to say. Uh, also, based on earlier studies and also on, this, on the findings, uh, we also did the MS-based analysis, mass-spec-based analysis, and focused then on fecal bile acids. And uh, as you see, not much turned out, but there are some small differences uh, in, in the bile acid profiles when it comes to the red is uh, severe ME patients and the green is the uh, household controls then. But as you see, also a large variability and uh, large overlap between the different groups. Uh, then serum samples were done, and uh, also with NMR for, for looking through 53 uh, quantitatively identified and, and uh, quantified molecules in, in circ circulation then. And uh, nothing really came out there. Uh, it's uh, a large overlap, big variability. Nothing came out between the two uh, control and patient groups, unfortunately. 
So summary for what I've published or what I'm talking about today uh, is that what we have found is that we have a significant and also repeated finding of uh, low-grade neuroinflammatory markers in cerebral spinal fluid from MECFS patients. We just followed up with a targeted approach that uh, I will present uh, next month when the data set is fully available. Uh, we have done a, a panel of 1,300 uh, neuroinflammatory markers and other markers with a targeted analysis. So. Uh, and also compared with multiple sclerosis patients, and it looks uh, very, very interesting. That's as much as I can tell right now. Uh, but next month, if the data will be available. Uh, as you saw, we have this disturbed stereogenesis found in the MECFS patients in circulation, uh, possibly related to dysfunctional mitochondria. Uh, I have not mentioned today the data set that we have done in uh, collaboration with uh, Carmen Scheibenbogen in, in Ber Berlin. We have looked at autoantibodies in uh, circulation from ME patients, and we could, in our data sets from two Swedish cohorts, repeat the data that uh, Carmen has published, uh, where we found in a set of patients uh, significantly elevated level of autoantibodies against adrenergic and muscarinic receptors. Uh, we did not find anything in cerebral spinal fluid, though, which is uh, a sort of a positive signal. If there is a problem with these autoantibodies, uh, we don't need to remove them from the central nervous system, at least. Uh, they are in the periphery. And then, finally, the study in collaboration with the group in Norwich, then, that this small metabolo uh, metabolic or metabolomic alteration was found in the gut of the severe ME patients compared with their household controls, but the differences are not remarkable, I would say, uh, in, in our hands. So the devil is in the details, uh, and uh, in the end of the day, I think we have to consider uh, the quality of the sample and methodology uh, that we are using. So we can have a method that is, uh, well, if it's really poor, we are looking at something that is not really hitting the target. It's both unreliable and unvalid. Uh, we can have a method that is fairly unreliable in reproducibility, but still centering around the target, so it could be still be valid. We could have a method that is super good on, on reproducibility, but totally off target. Or hopefully uh, we get a method that is both reliable and valid and actually hit the targets. So I think in still, when it comes to MECFS, we are uh, sometimes seeing this, we are sometimes seeing this. Uh, in ca some cases, we are actually hitting the target with a very valid method. So combination of the data sets that are now gathered around the world, I think will lead us in the right direction. Uh, but I want to conclude with that uh, we still have to keep on exploring. Uh, we have to come across uh, things that are reproducible and uh, that actually tells us what actually is going on. And I think the investments and also the encouragements that we get from both patients and their relatives, healthy controls that voluntarily give samples in these studies are fantastic. Uh, the support that we get from Open Medicine Foundation, this, well, in Sweden we get from the Swedish patient organization, RME, Invest in Me in the uh, UK, and then clinical collaborators that we are working with uh, in setting the sample set and also collecting material. So I want to express a warm thank you to all of them and uh, also to you for your attention. Tack så mycket. Um, have we got any questions? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Jonas, you made the really important point that um, in order for us to compare metabolomics work from one group to another, we need to do it quantitatively. Yeah. And so I wondered to what extent is it feasible to quantify a much larger number of the metabolites that mm -hmm. we run through uh, in a metabolomic study? Yeah. I mean, it, it could be done, but the problem, as you know, is that to get internal uh, absolute uh, stable isotope labeled quantitatively uh, secured uh, stable, uh, internal standards for everything is going to be very expensive. Um, 
One can get around it by having group internal standards that group per family of molecules, but it's not optimal. So if you really want to do it quantitatively, uh, we have to have a stable isotope, or if it's more spec, stable isotope labeled standard, uh, which is a limitation, definitely. And so to what extent, sorry, to what extent is that um, uh, susceptible to a higher throughput, uh, lower cost? Mm. Is it, what, what's actually limiting in producing those standards? Um, I think, uh, in principle, they are not that difficult to, to produce. It's just that the demand for certain metabolites, for instance, small molecules, has not been high enough. So the companies that actually are doing this for commercial uh, reasons, they don't have them in their catalog, first of all. And if you want to order it, you have to do special orders, and then it will be very expensive. Right. So uh, it seems like um, metabolomics is an, almost an industry yeah. already. And so shouldn't the... Uh, a collection of such standards be something that has a big enough market. Absolutely, I think so too. We buy quite a few of our standards we buy from Canada actually. <laughs> they are very good on, on uh, doing some of these uh, labelings that uh, and they have some special companies that are doing for lipids for instance on the also steroids. But I think, I mean one can do labelling yourself also uh, to some extent um, collaborating with a good organic chemist for instance. But you have always the problem with getting an absolute quantitative measure of that specific standard, and you also have to make sure that the purity is at least 99%. So uh, that is uh, yeah, still a problem. Yeah, thank you for your comment mm. on pregnenolone. Um, mm. I've noticed in patients over the years low pregnenolone, yep. and we have replaced that. And in some patients, that has raised their whole um, profile and has helped their brain, others hasn't, mm -hmm. um, but we can no longer test it in Australia. It's been, it's been removed from our... Okay. Our there was a laboratory mm -hmm. we used to use in Melbourne, but that's been... I've got no access to measure it anymore. We get samples shipped from all over the world, so uh, just uh, <laughs> send me an email so we can, we can set that up. I think, how, uh, how many of the patients, approximately, was it uh, who were responders of the... Um, most most responded. I tried to, if I if I found an isolated low DHEA cortisol, I'd go around the clock on the edge yeah. of the outflow of adrenals and measure what I could and come back to my other hormone. Yeah. Um, I didn't know which enzymes were affected. I don't know if it was the side chain cutting to, from cholesterol, the side chain cutter to form pregnenolone that was affecting, or if it was um, those within, because I can't measure pregnenolone. But mm. previously, when I could, if I replaced pregnenolone. I got some good results. Hmm. Interesting. Can I just sneak in again and ask another question? Um, just on the fact that you use the controls that were within the same household, I know if you look at my diet and my husband's diet, they're going to be two very different things. Mm -hmm. Did you give them a specific diet to take, or was it just sort of what they ate naturally? Uh, actually, for the collections, uh, which Daniel was spending a lot of efforts on, he, they tried to make sure that they were on a fairly strict diet. But, you know, uh, <laughs> one thing is wishing for it and, so, and doing it. But I think actually what we see is that the differences, uh, I didn't tell anything about the, the bacterial strains and so on that uh, they have also monitored in, in all these samples, but uh, the variability is very small actually. So I think uh, they were doing quite well. Only confounding factor, of course, could be that uh, when you have a household control, uh, it's someone, in, in these cases, they were related because it was quite often mother and daughter. Uh, there is an age difference. Okay, there's no gender difference, but that's, <laughs> yeah. So that can be one, one thing to look at. But uh, we were surprised, and I think um, yeah, many of the others that were involved in this study also were surprised that the variability is so small when you go for household controls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Berkowitz. So thank you to all three of our speakers again from this session. It's been very uh, informative, and I've still got a lot of questions. So we'll take a break now for tea and coffee before the final session of the day. So thank you.